our industry constantly changes. I, if anything, I think it's it leads to opportunities. Hello, friends. Welcome to a new episode of Merging Minds powered by BureauWorks. Today, I am excited, as every day, with a new guest and with my friend, Carrie Fisher, who has starred in a few um, Star Wars movies, right, Carrie? <laughs> oh, you saw those? I've seen them all. I've seen them all. I've seen them all. I've seen them all. I talked to our friend, Jeff Beatty, who is working in, in Disney a lot about those, about, about, a lot about the new work they're doing at Disney. So I've seen them all. I've seen all of you. I've been a part What's of your you. favorite? What's your favorite? My, favorite? my favorite is oh, uh, um, my favorite is the last the last my favorite is the, the Empire Strikes Back, but from the new ones is the last one that was uh, released. The last one, I cannot remember the name, but the last one, the super last one that was released. Three, the three, last three, Jedi. The last Jedi, yes. With the uh, uh, I just watched it last night. It's embarrassing to say this, right? But <laughs> I watched it for like the fiftieth time last night. No, I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, friends. <laughs> This is Carrie. As you can see, she's a personal friend of mine. Uh, and, and I was chatting with her the other day and I said, Carrie, you should please, can I invite you to come and to, to, to talk in, 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 in our podcast, Emerging Minds? Like, um, for those who have been following my travels around the world and what I did the last years, Carrie has participated in my in the events that I was organizing all the time. Because to me, Carrie is an inspiration and is one of those leaders that when she speaks, people listen to, she's got over 25 years of experience in working in the localization industry. She's a mentor. She's 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 on the board of several organizations. I don't know what else am I forgetting, Carrie? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Conference speaker, mother, great friend. What else? What else? Um, tennis player? I don't know. Tennis player. Don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is fun. It's fun to get reconnected again. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is. And, and today, Carrie, like um, uh, the, the friends that follow our podcast, they come to hear about the, the experience and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the life of those leaders we, we always invite to come here. Uh, so I always try to, to start our conversations in our podcast by asking, how the hell did you stumble upon the localization industry? Because as you know, it's a very beautiful, small community. It's a very particular, so to say, job. It's a very particular sector. Yeah. How does somebody like you, you're based in Idaho in, in the United States? That's correct, right? Yeah. Are you where are you from? How do you stumble upon the industry? Tell us a little bit about how you started your journey here. Well, so I have a degree in French from Northern Illinois University. So I'll, I'll, I graduated in 1990. That shows you how old I am. Um, moved to New Hampshire where I got my first job, which was at a company called Transparent Language and they sold language learning software. So people who wanted to learn, you know, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, we had this awesome software that uh, had, a, it had a different spin on, on how to learn a language. And I really, it resonated with me. Then we took that concept and reversed it. So then we were selling this software to France, Germany, Italy, Japan, for people who wanted to learn English. So of course we realized that we had to translate the user interface, the documentation, the box, you know, the disket labels that tells you how old <laughs> There was I am. no interest as we know it back then, right? So you're also one of the pioneers of, of, of there, the first people that created that club of, of localizers. Yeah, right? We didn't know anything. Um, the first, I think, Renato, localization Anna, conference. Salvo, you, a lot of friends that I could count, yeah? Sorry, sorry. That Renato is the first person that I remember meeting at a Lisa conference. So yeah, localization, internationalization standards association, whatever it's called, right? Which doesn't exist anymore. Gala kind of took its place. So um, yeah, I just remember meeting Renato in 90, geez, I can't even remember what year it was, right? But yeah, we started localizing in 93, 94. So it's been over 30 years, I think, but I didn't know what I was at the time. You know, I was just this person who had volunteered to get our stuff translated. And that's, that's how this whole journey started. Incredible, incredible. And since then, in these almost 30 years, you've been working in some of the biggest few multinationals out there, right? For example, can you, can you let us know? Yeah, Oracle, right? Second largest software company in the world. They acquired Hyperion software in 2007. 
And I became, I went from being a director of an entire department to being one of 250 people in the translation group. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> yeah. But that was, you know, it was kind of cool because then you could see, um, and I hate this word. I do love it because it's from Star Trek, but the assimilation, uh, if you're a Borg person, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, Oracle would buy these companies and then assimilate their translation departments into their own collective. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm using Star Trek terminology, but um, that's what it kind of felt like, to be honest. And then then you got to see what it was like. We were called unofficially the translation factory because oh, it wow. was a factory. You had with billions of words being produced and translated every year, this is what you had to do. There were no one-offs. There was no, oh, we do it this way. No, you don't. <laughs> you do it our way. And then the acquisition of some microsystems was a, was another biggie. But um, yeah, Oracle taught me a lot. I think how big companies do it. And then I've worked for companies that are teeny tiny, like bodybuilding.com, which I moved to after Oracle and got to see how the, the little fry do it. Um, and now to Subway, another big brand. I don't have to explain what my company does for the first time ever. So that's really nice. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. I'm a client. I eat Subway constantly all the time when I travel, especially. Not, I am talking from Greece now here. Unfortunately, there's none, but I am. A, I use Subway a lot. So. We used to have like yeah. one, <laughs> but I, yeah, yes. and it was only open during the summer. So, of course, that, that's not sustainable. So I'm sure we had to close our <laughs> No, 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 no. And uh, like, I know you've been uh, delivering solutions in several uh, markets in languages and, 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 uh, and, and situations, right? During all this time, uh, uh, I was able to count that you were able to deliver solutions in up to 45 different international markets. That's my count, right? And, uh, and uh, I was thinking that must have been a, an interesting, interesting uh, thing to do in several situations, in several companies, etc. And uh, I would like to ask you, like when when doing your job, especially those very early days, can you think of some difficulties that were like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm even, go, even going to sort this out. How am I even going to do this? Do you, do you, can you share some of those with us? I don't know if I ever came across a situation that wasn't solvable. I remember several times being overwhelmed. Oh, and this one time embarrassed, um, you know, <laughs> Just, it's amazing what a typo can, how a typo can change a word. How a missing letter can tell change me, tell me about that. something from, am I allowed to swear on your show? Yes, yes, yes. This is not the BBC. Okay. So I think, you know, instead of uh, whatever was supposed to be said about consolidation software, you know, financial consolidation, there was one word in French, you know, it was missing a letter. Um, and so instead of, you know, I don't know, downloading something, it was, um, taking a shit <laughs> in French. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and it went out, uh, we, nobody caught it. And the French thought it was hilarious. Like the, thank God. Right. So the French salespeople were like, um, <laughs> this is in our documentation. I was like, oh my God. We're, we're selling more. We're selling more than expected. Thanks to your time. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. So thank, I was just so, I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. This is a, you know, this is a pretty basic thing. Right. But um, yeah, but they thought it was funny. Thank God. So okay. yeah, it okay. wasn't that's a big deal as I thought, right? Challenging, so, challenging situation to face at the beginning, but then if it ended up well, that's, that's okay. Like, I mean, things happen, mistakes happen, right? Like you got to sort yeah. them out, but mistakes happen, right? And uh, through your career, you've also, I mean, like, as I said at the beginning, when, when, when Carrie uh, offers her opinion and, and her points of view, I think we should listen because you always have great points of view from the leader since you're a very reputed leader. I know you're now a team of one, but you're also participating in several, in boards of several organizations within the localization industry, also with out of the localization industry. Tell us about yeah. that. Okay. I know you remember so, being the president of the localization and also a member of the- I was the, the president last year, yep, of, of Women in Localization. And so you're singing um, at the event, awesome. I'm still there. <laughs> and singing, singing, singing there. And singing. Oh, God. Yes, you were there. You, you witnessed it. That was after three glasses of wine, in my defense. No, it took me yes. three glasses of wine to get to do, you know, to have to do that. But, um, uh, so uh, this year, we created a, a new program called Global Growth and Diversity. Um, and Anna Schlegel asked me if I would run that. And, uh, you know, I, 
to be honest, I was willing to step away. I, I like to give other women the opportunity to be in those leadership positions. Uh, it's important, especially like you said, I'm a team of one. It's not like I'm going to become a, a VP or a C-level, you know, of localization at Subway. That's not going to happen. But in order to get certain types of leadership skills, I think it's important to really stretch yourself and feel super uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. um, becoming president was last year was really uncomfortable for me. Um, I, I feel more at ease in the, the existing role of um, board sponsor of the new program. But it doesn't escape me that a white straight woman is in charge of a diversity program. <laughs> um, but that's how I'm learning. And uh, I'm taking so many classes and courses and learning from other people um, how, just how to behave, the right words to say. It's, it's all about learning and expanding your mind. And so I'm very grateful for that experience. So uh, as I was saying, like one of the in, in regarding this this particular thing you mentioned now about the, how it was difficult for you to take this role and how you got out, got out of your comfort zone and did it. Like I interviewed last year the amazing Minette Norman and her book, the last yes. book she wrote about the bolding they call the boldly inclusive leader, in which she points out there. Uh, the importance of of being as inclusive as possible. It's a great yes. it's a beacon of light to to what to what to, to positions to the, like that one that you're that you're having now. Uh, so yeah. and it's important to to note, you know, it's not a checkbox on some kind of list, right? Okay. It's making sure that we are inclusive as an organization. And I think inclusivity brings diversity. So an opportunity, not to mention opportunity. So I'm super excited about the initiatives, you know, opening new chapters. Um, and then opening new chapters in Africa. We want to make sure that everyone is included mm -hmm. and invited, invited to the dance. So it was described to me as, you know, inclusivity is being invited to the dance. Diversity is being invited to dance. So we want to make sure the, the, inclusivity, the inclusivity is there, the invitation is there. And then let's bring these people in because, you know, one thing that struck me about bias in general is because of our unconscious bias throughout the world, we're leaving $300 trillion on the table every single year. What does that do? You know, what does that mean for a nonprofit? It means we're not, we're not getting the whole picture and we, mm -hmm. uh, yes, we're global. Yes. You know, we've been doing this for so long, but uh, I think we're missing a bigger picture of not, you know, not including everybody and maybe just not realizing that we're not including everybody. So Let's look at our website. Let's look at the language that we're using. Let's look at all the chapters that we could, you know, reach out to and invite them to be a part of. I'm a member of Women in Localization too. I try to attend, support. I think sometimes we've sponsored as well as a company. Yes. Uh, things, uh, and uh, Bureau Works has been a sponsor of Women in Localization as well. And is I think it is. I'm, I'm not sure about this right now, but yeah, I think we are. And, uh, and uh, one of the... One of the things I wanted to ask you is like when like and, and to encourage more chapters to be open because I think it's beautiful and, and the cause of women the root cause of women in location is amazing and we need more communities like this, right? Uh, uh, for our friends listening who might be interested in hey, opening a chapter, uh, what's the procedure to follow? Do you guys reach out to them? Do they reach out to you? How do you do that stuff? I think it's a combination of both. Okay. So I did I did a post on LinkedIn, you know what? Just <laughs> I was gonna sing a song. I'm not kidding. I had made up a song around frozen, you know, um, do you want to build a snowman? So do you want to build a chapter? I had the whole thing down. I had, you know, and I'm like, I'm not going to do this again. I can't, I just can't sing again. <laughs> so like, like, I did a post instead and I did, you know, okay. and, uh, and we got great response. Um, we got someone from Kent university who wants to start another student chapter. Yes. Kent University out of Ohio is another great um, academia place that, that has a, a strong localization, you know, foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and then Albania. Yay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, That's far from the US. That's, that is very far from you guys. Yeah. It is. It is. And I want to learn more about the, the localization community in Albania. So I'm excited about that one. And then we're... You know, we're partnering with ALCA uh, in in Africa to 
uh, we're going to be a part of their conference in, later in August, and then we're going to, you know, really hope to form a chapter. We're going to stout, start in South Africa with hopefully a, a dual, you know, one chapter in, you know, Cape Town and Johannesburg and, and build that community um, and then reach out to the other African nations. The mentoring aspect of women in localization, and it's it's very, very strong. Uh, are you a, you're a mentor yourself. Am I wrong? No. I think no. uh, I mentor three, three, yeah, and I, I really, uh, really enjoy it. Um, I, like, what, are, what are the foundations of good mentorship from your point of view? Tell me, please. Listening. I, I, listening. You need to listen to what people are struggling with, where they want to be mentored, what parts of their life. It's sometimes it's not just about uh, getting a job or this or that. The other thing you have to listen to what's going on in their in their lives as well because it makes a difference on how you respond to to an issue so i think listening is the most important thing you could possibly do to be a mentor um and you don't have to have a lot of experience i mean we yes i've i've got a lot of experience but we have mentors that have had five seven years you know of, of localization experience i like that because they have come into the industry at a very interesting time. I've been with it forever. Um, so I've got, yeah, I've got the history, but um, sometimes it's really cool to have a newer localization professional talk about how they, not only how they got into it, but what they're seeing. And, you know, it can definitely affect somebody's, I don't know, life, perception, job, to have somebody who's just gotten into it. What do they think of it? How did they get into it? What, you know, what tools should I use? I, I, like, I'm sorry to have stepped there, but I, I think it's super interesting this point you touch upon. Like one of the guests of the podcast was Caitlin Bostman, Bos, Boswick, sorry, uh, who recently came in. And we had a very interesting conversation uh, speaking about how we should um, uh, um, promote more uh, a concept that I, I don't think we created, but we, we discussed about, which is called the reverse mentoring. Like you have, like it should be set on stone that a mentor is somebody that is uh uh, an older person than, than the mentee, right? And then we were discussing a super interesting thing, which is like, what? No, like she was telling me, she's a real veteran. And she was telling me like, hey, I really like to connect with people that are younger than me and hear their experiences because I, I, I'm in a bubble of things. Like I've completed my professional life. I've completed everything. Like you could say that I've learned everything I need to, to learn to live a successful life, but still, fuck that. I really want to continue learning. So Reverse mentoring for me is getting along, sorry, setting up time with somebody like you, Javi, like 25 years younger than me or whatever, something to hear the perspectives, to improve certain things, right? Absolutely. I think I, you know, I learn more from my mentees than I do. <laughs> it's definitely a, it's, you know, mutually beneficial. Let me put it that way. I learn so much of what's going on now, you know, in the industry, in, in, at different levels. And uh, yeah, I, I would like to say nothing surprises me anymore, but I am surprised. <laughs> yeah. And also, I like the, the part that you said as well about like listening, 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 listening to others and how difficult it is sometimes, right? Especially when you don't have a day, right? Like it's like, fuck, I need to do this thing now and I need to do whatever. And I need to listen. Isn't it because funny? Yes. It's, it's super funny, isn't it, right? And that's the part where, where and, I, and I've been, I, I, like I, I, I'm, I'm nobody. It's difficult for me to to do. But I've always been uh, uh, advocating for a more empathetic way of dealing with people. I've learned this. I'm learning this through the last five, six years of my life. Listening more, asking more questions. Like I know personal friends that we share that have told me, like you should do it better. I, I've done it better. I'm improving. There's never a moment that I'm saying I've, I've learned enough because there's always continuous learning, right? But uh, this that the fact that you mentioned this is that eh, I think we could be doing we're doing good right so I mean we're doing good stuff right so, so. we are and it's funny yeah. you mentioned empathy because um, I learned recently that the people that learn language different languages are more empathetic than people that don't you know there's empirical evidence that our industry. That's what I'm saying. We should go into politics. All of us should go into politics. If we ruled all the countries, this would be a very different world. 
<laughs> but uh, we get it. We get it. We're open. Yeah. We're open to other ideas. We're not these closed-minded people that um, don't understand other cultures and don't accept um, other people. And it's anyway. It's I'll, get, I'll get off my rant, but yeah. no, it's cool. No, but it's it's. But I understand. It's, it's difficult. Like uh, yeah, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to 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 hear them because I, I to, to understand them. And I understand as well that we're in the, we're seeing the world from a very global perspective because uh, m most of us in the localization industry are somebody that was born somewhere and lives in a foreign country is working for a foreign company, right? So that mix, unless you're the stupidest person that has ever stepped foot on, on on earth, you are forced to you have to be you have to do this. Otherwise, you would not be able to communicate with your colleagues that are Greeks or Germans or Americans or whatever, right? That's that's the point, and that's where empathy plays a key role. I think that that's the thing, right? I do too, and I also think Europeans have the advantage because you're exposed to different languages from the day you're born. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm recording this podcast from Greece in summer 2024, and I don't speak a word. And I manage, but we get along. I get along. Uh, it's, yeah, it, but the exposure to that is bigger than probably there. Maybe I can. I don't know. The yeah. American school system, right? So I grew up in the 80s and I was forced to take two years of a different language. And because of that exposure, that's why I'm in my career today. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to slip in my my plug for the other board that I'm on, which is Language Connects Foundation. Tell us about that, because I want to know about it. I never heard of this. Like I saw you. I saw post you. Yeah, we're brand new, brand new board. And I, it, again, this mission of supporting global language teachers in America resonated with me. And I'll tell you how it became so important to me. Um, my son was a freshman in high school three years ago, and I was excited to see, hey, what languages are on the docket, you know, that you have to take? What are, what are your choices? And he said, well, language is just one of them. I was like, what do you mean? Well, I can take photography. I can take this, you know, lay, arts language got, you know, shoved into this arts criteria or, you know, section of, of the, of academia. You're no longer forced or, to take a language in high school. Um, as far as I can tell, 13 states require at least two years of a different language or a native language, North Dakota. Good job. Um, in order to graduate and you know and, and go on to college, and uh, so I've been watching and researching the language departments in the United States, either go you know get super small or disappear altogether, and it really saddens me and it frightens me, not only from you know a, a language lover perspective, but what does this mean for Americans who Mm -hmm. can't or don't aren't exposed to different languages and therefore not exposed to different cultures uh, where are the next generation of localization professionals going to come from in, you know in the united states if we're not even exposing our children to to different mm -hmm. languages and um, so the language connects foundation is a nonprofit, and we are solely dedicated to the you know supporting our language uh, academia and it, through grants, through scholarships, through student ambassador programs. Um, and I became aware of it. They asked me to be on a podcast and then they said, Hey, we're forming a board. I said, great, I'll be on it. And then they asked for a, a chair and I said, great, I'll do that. <laughs> having, having just finished my chairship, uh, at women in localization, I felt like I, kind of knew what what to expect and you know what to do so you kind of you have that drive that is not it's, it's that drive of of of, of helping and, lead, and leading that's 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 not easy to find and, and that was going to lead me to a question that i just had before that like did you also stumble upon leading because a lot of people say like hey i have no other way than just leading here or are you a natural born leader how do you define yourself you know that's a good question um when i was a kid I was often putting on plays, um, even like puppet stuff and charging my family five cents to get in and see my play. Um, 
so speaking and uh, being in front of people, uh, yeah, it's nerve wracking to begin with, but it, I think that builds leadership skills and helps you to communicate. So if you can communicate to 250 people effectively, you can communicate to a team of five, or you can communicate to C-level people. Authenticity, it's all about just being yourself and being authentic and not trying to please people or say things you think they want to hear. It's all about just transparency and, and being yourself. And I, that makes you a leader. Um, I, like I said, it's so way I'm never going to be some director or VP or anything like, like that, but I, I am the leader of the entire localization department, if you will, for subway. That, that's, that's true. And, and, and leaders also often uh, like, like everybody else often face burnout. And now lately, like for the last five, seven years, I would say five, yeah, five, seven, nine years, maybe 10 years, we've been speaking about this more, about mental wellness, about uh, burnout, about, hey, I don't feel good. Hey, I am a leader, but I don't know every fucking thing. I don't have to know everything. And, and that's changed, thankfully, right? Like, uh, uh, so, so in those situations, uh, uh, what strategies do you recommend? What is your goal or what is your goal to uh, um, strategy to manage stress or, or burnout or, 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 or this kind of it's, moment? It's kind of, maybe irony isn't the right term, but it's ironic that when you get stressed out, you feel overwhelmed and you, you feel like you just can't take one more meeting with a friend or, you know, you can't go to this women in localization meeting because you're too busy. That's where I find my solace, my energy building backup, talking through issues with people like you. Um, there's a, a women's group that I belong to. We meet once uh, a month on Friday afternoons. Um, it's with Pascal Tremblay. It's with oh, Laura yeah. Daly. She it's podcast. Yeah, she was Oh, I love Pascal. Oh, did she talk about it? Did she talk about it? Nurturing? I don't think she knows she is, yeah, but yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. No, no, no. And there's just a few of us, right? And we we meet on that Friday afternoon, and that's where we talk about ugh, frustrations at work, and this is happening, and everything stays with these people. You learn who these people are, and when you are in crisis, that's who you go to. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's, that's cool. Like... I guess it's like a group of friends that you need to to bend in, right? So so they build you back up. They how really many guys, how many participants are there? How many people participate in that? Is it, is it like a close? Oh, the nurturing one. Uh, I believe there's five of us. It's small, and then mm -hmm. I meet with one particular person again. That's once a month, and it's on a Tuesday. But uh, you know, Itty, and I meet. Oh yeah, I know her. I know her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's just to talk about life, you know, dating, um, what's happening at work. And to me, yeah. uh, that becomes a mentoring session, you know? Yes. That what, one thing, and this reminds me of the, perhaps, um, my, uh, like, uh, um, thanks to what I do and the, my personality and the way I am, I've developed a, a role in which I am exposed to being a lot of the time with people like you, like other friends from the industry, and I love it. I don't want to live in a different way, but to others uh, who might be working more separate or siloed, because I have a lot of calls with people who tell me like, I'm isolated here, right? I don't I don't know a lot of people, right? And it's like, really? That's, I know everybody. But so so for those list who are listening, there's there's groups like this, you can join them. Like, and on, and on top of it, my totally. conclusion, would be, yes, my conclusion would be like people like Carrie, like those who you see on social media, on LinkedIn, or those newsletters. They're they're human. They're human. They're human. And we're people. approachable and we're open to connecting. Can we talk about local lunch? I mean, local lunch is the perfect way to be introduced to like-minded people. You know, you think you're in a silo, you think you're alone, but oh my God, there's a local lunch in my city. Let me go. Or it's a virtual local lunch this time for San Diego. Yay. I get to join. I've joined local lunches in, in Dublin, in the UK. And, you know, this is how you network and meet new people and meet, you know, I don't know, you just connect. There's some people that you connect on a different level with. 
I've found that local lunch is a great way to start that. There's, there's for those friends that are listening and they really want there's there's approach people, do it in an empathetic way, do not oversell. Don't just go there and, and try to make friends, putting friends before results or friends before uh, in economic interest and, and things work and there's and you can make real good friends and you can help oh, yeah. and you can be more wealthy, right? Gary, I don't want to take much more of your time, but I want you to like just give me a premonition of what's coming. Like what's coming? What's, what does Gary Fisher think that is coming? What would you say? Like if I am the new guy in the industry and I'm coming in and it's like, holy shit, you're so fucked. Or, oh my God, it's so many interesting things that are coming. Tell me honestly. Right. Is it an opportunity or is it, am I stepping into a shit show? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I honestly, um, our industry constantly changes. I, if anything, I think it's it leads to opportunities. So I'm always like you, I'm the glass half full. I'm, I'm never the glass half empty because there are always new things to learn. This is a good thing. This is a good thing, you know, about Gen AI, because now we can learn how it can help us with everyday tasks or mundane stuff. Um, new tools are being introduced that are native. It's no longer, you know, I don't think about the TMS solution. It's about what's going to work for your company. And now we've got a million choices to make. I think it's for me, it's the land of opportunity and, I, I, and I'm not a linguist. And so I know there's a lot of concern about how, you know, am I still going to be relevant? And I, the answer is yes, there's always going to be humans, right? And it's about how to adapt and, or finding the companies that cannot use AI. Am I going to use Gen AI at all for any reason for my app? <laughs> the subway app? No, I, I can't imagine what it would sound like. I can't have our guests not knowing how to order a sandwich, you know, it, so <laughs> it's not this gloom and doom, I think, projection that everyone seems to think it is. You, but you still read those things from time to time. And yeah, I mean, I don't know, I, I, like, I guess it's depending on everyone's uh, Walk of life and view of life. It's right? so, so true. Kerry, thank you so much for being a, a guest here today. It's a pleasure. Like, I cannot wait to see you again soon. Catch up in person. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm here for anything you need, my friend. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, everybody, <laughs> for being here today and for a new episode of Merging Minds. We'll come back soon with another leader and with another life experience. Bye-bye.